when prime suspects one by one start turning up dead, the prosecutors begin to fear that a mastermind killer will never be brought to justice. December 9, 1988, a Hollywood cameraman was found murdered in his Southern California home. It would take investigators more than five years to bring a suspect to trial. Prosecutor Janice Morisi would attempt to find justice in the aftermath of this brutal crime. When you prosecute cases and you see the crime scene photos and you see the horror of what has actually happened and you see the devastation and you meet the family members and you see these things happening in the community that you live in and the, the victims and the victims' families are real people, um, you just, you have a sense of, of a need to make sure that justice is done. In this episode, some of the names of family members and witnesses have been changed to protect their identities. A few weeks before Christmas 1988, in the secluded neighborhood of Sepulveda, a few miles north of Hollywood, Los Angeles police investigate a homicide. A man named Robert Samuels was found shot to death in his home. The victim's wife, Mary Ellen Samuels, told investigators that she and her daughter Melissa had stopped by her husband's house to drop off their dog. They discovered Robert lying dead on the floor. It appeared that the victim had been about to walk into a room containing a tanning bed when he was attacked. Although there seemed to be some minor property damage inside the house, detectives observed there were no signs of forced entry and no signs of burglary. Mary Ellen Samuel's best friend, Anne Marie Hambly, arrived at Robert's home to console her grieving friend. She, too, was interviewed, but could give investigators no information about the crime. Detective George Daly was assigned to head the murder investigation. One of his first tasks would be to eliminate the family members as suspects. In most uh, cases of murder, uh, I would say 85% uh, or more uh, of the time, the murderer or conspirators are uh, someone who the victim knows. Mary Ellen's daughter, Melissa, was given a gunshot residue test. This procedure detects any gunpowder residue on an individual who has recently discharged a firearm. Mary Ellen Samuels also agreed to be tested. The results for both mother and daughter were negative. Neither had recently fired a weapon. That night, Mary Ellen agreed to visit the police station. Investigators wanted to know if Robert might have known his attacker, or if Mary Ellen knew of anyone who might have a reason to kill him. She told investigators that she and her husband had been separated for two years and were on friendly terms. She mentioned several people who might have held grudges against her husband, but her theories provided no substantial leads. An autopsy revealed that Samuel suffered blunt force trauma to his head prior to being shot. It was an immediate disabling injury. 
The gunshot that killed Samuels was fired mere inches from his head, approximately 12 to 24 hours before the body's discovery. Where was the entry point? Fragments extracted from the victim revealed that a 16-gauge shotgun had been used in the attack. The blast had been fired through a pillow placed over the victim's head after he had been struck to the floor. The killing appeared to be the cold-blooded act of an assassin. News of Samuel's death spread quickly. Robert Samuels was a well-respected camera technician and had worked on such films as Heaven Can Wait, Lethal Weapon 2, and The Color Purple. Detective Daly had little to go on. There were no fingerprints, no fiber or hair evidence at the scene, and no eyewitnesses. He next turned to the victim's family and paid a visit to Robert Samuel's sister. Susan Conroy provided a detailed background of her brother's relationship with his wife, Mary Ellen. Robert had been infatuated with Mary Ellen since elementary school. How much to gain from this? But it was not until years later, after her first marriage ended, that the two became reacquainted. May I ask you one little fell in love and eventually married. I'm sure Together, they raised Mary Ellen's daughter. And I'm sure. But in 1987, Mary Ellen she took her daughter and abruptly there. moved and out. Left Robert, there? Conroy said, was devastated. Though they were separated, the couple continued to operate a sandwich shop they owned in Van Nuys. Now, with Robert's death, Mary Ellen was the sole owner. Several days after the shooting, Detective Daly visited Mary Ellen at the sandwich shop. Just take me a few minutes. The detective requested a list of her employees for routine interviews in the investigation. Mary Ellen promised to provide the list. She also agreed to visit the police station to take a polygraph test. In your part, Investigators told Mary Ellen the test was routine. No. It was necessary to exclude her as a possible suspect. She was asked if she participated in the shooting of her husband. She said she did not. She was asked if she knew who killed her husband. And again, she said no. The polygraph administrator determined that Mary Ellen Samuels had answered the questions truthfully. Thirty days after the murder, Daly received a call from an insurance company. The insurance investigator asked if Mary Ellen Samuels was a suspect in the homicide investigation. As Robert Samuels' widow, she was listed as the beneficiary of policies totaling more than half a million dollars. Daly learned that Robert Samuel's insurance policies would pay off the mortgages on the sandwich shop and his Sepulveda home, and that Mary Ellen would inherit both properties. Daly informed the insurance agent that he had no evidence connecting her to the murder. Since she was not a suspect, the agent explained, the insurance company would begin to process her claims. The total value of the policies would exceed $600,000. Several months passed without a single lead, and the investigation was officially classified as a cold case. But Daly refused to give up although he knew that as time passed, the likelihood of solving the crime would become more and more remote.
He received his first break in the investigation when a friend of Mary Ellen's, Jane Stevens, came forward with new information. Jane had met Mary Ellen at a bar several months before the murder. According to Stevens, she and Mary Ellen often discussed each other's divorces. At one point, Mary Ellen told her that she wanted Robert out of her life permanently. And she needed to borrow $10,000 to pay for a hitman. Jane had dismissed the comment, convinced that her friend's plan had been inspired by alcohol. During this interview, Jane also mentioned a man named James Bernstein. She said Bernstein worked at Mary Ellen's sandwich shop and was employed there when the murder took place. Daly noticed that Bernstein's name was not on the employee list that Mary Ellen had given to him. According to Jane, Bernstein was a boyfriend of Mary Ellen's daughter, Melissa. James Bernstein agreed to come into the station for questioning. In the interview, he denied any knowledge of the murder of Robert Samuels. But Daly was certain Bernstein knew more. During my investigation, I had interrogated Mr. Bernstein on occasions. And I felt that at some point, at some future point, Mr. Bernstein would assist in uh, solving the murder of Mr. Uh, Samuels by uh, telling me what his part, what other part, uh, other people played in uh, the murder. Daly decided to take a closer look into the relationship between Bernstein and Melissa Samuels. He visited Melissa's Los Angeles High School and questioned several of her classmates. They told him about rumors that Melissa's mother, Mary Ellen, had hired a hitman to kill Robert. Detective George Daly's case was finally gaining momentum. Feeling the pressure of the investigation, Mary Ellen filed a complaint with the captain of the Los Angeles Homicide Division, charging that Daly was harassing her. The charges were never substantiated, and Daly's investigation continued undeterred. In May 1989, five months after the murder of Robert Samuels, Detective Daly received a call from a man identifying himself only as a friend of Melissa's. He claimed that Mary Ellen had asked him to kill her husband, but that he had turned down the request. He said that James Bernstein told him that Robert Samuel's killer was a man named Mike Silva. A check of police records revealed that Silva had a minor rap sheet. He lived just outside Los Angeles. After months of frustrating work, Daly had several important witnesses who claimed that Mary Ellen Samuels had planned her husband's death. But he would still need evidence to corroborate the stories. Stories that were based on hearsay one witness who was anonymous, and a killer who, for now, was untouchable. After five months with no leads, Detective George Daly finally had a prime suspect in the murder of Hollywood cameraman Robert Samuels, his widow, Mary Ellen Samuels. Information from friends, associates, and an anonymous caller indicated that Mary Ellen, with the help of an employee named James Bernstein, hired a man named Mike Silva to kill her husband. But an anonymous tip would not be enough to arrest Silva. Daly would need more evidence. 
In order to find proof of a conspiracy, he obtained a multi-location search warrant for Mary Ellen Samuel's condominium, Mike Silva's residence, and James Bernstein's apartment. At Mary Ellen's condominium, police discovered evidence that since her husband's death, Mary Ellen had sold the sandwich shop. They found receipts and bank records showing she had made a $50,000 cash payment on a new Porsche and had spent large amounts of money on expensive lingerie, designer clothes, catered parties, and rented limousines. She had also made an offer to purchase a condominium in Cancun, Mexico. Bank records indicated the spending spree was funded by Robert's life insurance policy and the sale of the sandwich shop. But detectives still couldn't find any direct evidence linking Mary Ellen to the murder. Through the search warrant, police were able to subpoena her phone records. When the search of Mike Silva's residence was conducted, no evidence was recovered. The police were able to subpoena Silva's phone records. Daly suspected that Silva had been the shooter and Bernstein had been the go-between. The detective questioned Silva but got nowhere. Daly and his investigators also searched James Bernstein's apartment. When they arrived, Bernstein was not at home. They performed a cursory search and found no evidence. As a matter of procedure, Daly left behind a copy of the search warrant. Daly wanted to locate Bernstein for more questioning, but he was nowhere to be found. His apartment manager said he hadn't been seen in weeks. He said he'd heard from another tenant that Bernstein was hiding out from the police. Daly spent hours reviewing phone records from Mary Ellen's home and the sandwich shop, as well as those of Mike Silva. He noticed that Mary Ellen and Silva had both called Bernstein on numerous occasions. To complete the conspiracy theory, Bernstein's phone records would need to reflect return calls, which they did not. Daly still did not have all the pieces he would need to make his case. Then on July 27th, 1989, seven months after the murder of Robert Samuels, Daly received a phone call from James Bernstein's apartment. Thank you for that information. We the caller identified himself as Ventura County Sergeant Robert McFarland. He told Daly he was at Bernstein's apartment investigating a homicide. Detective Daly rushed to the apartment and learned from McFarland that James Bernstein had been found dead in Ventura County, 100 miles north of Los Angeles. When McFarland discovered a copy of the previous search warrant posted by Detective Daly, he immediately called him. McFarland told Daly that a few weeks earlier, Ventura County Police received a report. A couple of hikers had found a mummified body in Lakewood Canyon. The Ventura County Medical Examiner's Office knew it would be difficult to identify the victim. The remains had decomposed under the dry California sun. But their autopsy report did confirm that their John Doe had been brutally strangled. His larynx had been crushed. The Ventura County Medical Examiner would try to obtain a fingerprint from the mummified hand. In the laboratory, they removed the hand and rehydrated one of the victim's fingers. They eventually succeeded in getting a single print. Running the print through a computerized fingerprint system called CalID, investigators caught a break. 
the victim had an arrest file with the police. His name was James Bernstein. Upon learning of the death of uh, Mr. Bernstein, uh, my heart sank because I figured, hey, that, you know, one of our most important uh, people in this whole investigation, uh, or a person who we believed would become one of our most important people in this investigation, was gone. Phone receipt books, small books, that kind of thing. The Ventura investigators found a clue that Daly's investigative team had overlooked on their first search of the apartment. It was a simple phone card, and it would dramatically change the course of the investigation. It would help to solve the mystery of how the co-conspirators were communicating. Investigators now knew why the phone records from Bernstein's apartment did not show calls to Mary Ellen and Silva. Bernstein had placed his calls using the phone card. The unraveling of the conspiracy was nearly complete. We discovered that a half hour before uh, Mrs. Samuels told the police she found her husband on the floor of his Bahama Street home, that there had been a conversation between someone at James Bernstein's home, someone at Mike Silva's home, and someone at the Subway Sandwich Shop. Bernstein's calling card records also showed that during the last days of his life, he had made calls from the home of Anne Marie Hamley, Mary Ellen's best friend. Detectives from Ventura County and Los Angeles decided to work together to solve both crimes, the murder of James Bernstein and the murder of Robert Samuels. They converged on Anne-Marie Hambly's property. There, stored in a back shed, detectives found a bag of Bernstein's clothes. Hambly was taken in for questioning. It became clear that she was one of the last people to see James Bernstein alive. In order to break open the conspiracy, they offered Hambly immunity from prosecution. Sergeant Robert McFarland helped lead the Ventura County investigation of the Bernstein homicide. Aunt Hamley told us that uh, Mary Ellen Samuels had arranged for Paul Gall and Daryl Edwards to murder James Bernstein. Hamley's live-in boyfriend, Paul Edwin Gall, and his friend, Daryl Ray Edwards, were paid $5,000 by Mary Ellen Samuels to kill Bernstein. With Ann Hambly's testimony, the homicide investigations of both Los Angeles and Ventura County pointed directly toward one person, Mary Ellen Samuels. And the investigators knew it was time to bring her to justice. On January 26, 1990, Mary Ellen Samuels was arrested and charged with two counts of murder, with special circumstances of multiple murder and murder for financial gain, for her role in the deaths of both Robert Samuels and James Bernstein. Okay, sir, could you move just a little bit over to your left? Thank you. The same day, police apprehended Paul Edwin Gall, one of the men who Mary Ellen allegedly hired to kill James Bernstein. Over here. Five days later, Gall's accomplice, Daryl Ray Edwards, walked into the Foothill Police Station and surrendered. Investigators looked again to question Mike Silva, the man they believed James Bernstein had hired to kill Mary Ellen Samuel's husband. They would never get that opportunity. Mike Silver was dead. He had shot his girlfriend and then turned the gun on himself. I don't know, the last time I saw my dad with my mom was Bernstein, and I don't know when the last time I saw him. Police re-interviewed Mary Ellen's daughter, Melissa. But she provided no new information 
and with no direct evidence implicating her in the two murders, the authorities chose not to file any charges against her. Mary Ellen was ordered to be held without bail by the San Fernando Municipal Court. Okay. Ventura Sergeant Robert McFarland had led the investigation into the murder of James Bernstein. The most frustrating aspect of the case was the fact that everyone we talked to in probably 50 or 60 interviews that we conducted uh, knew who was responsible for the murder of James Bernstein. And they said it was Mary Ellen Samuels. But as police officers, we need a little bit more than just somebody saying that another person was involved. We need cooperation. That corroboration would come from Paul Edwin Gall and Daryl Edwards, who faced first-degree murder charges for their roles in the slaying of James Bernstein. When the district attorney's office offered the possibility of a reduced charge, both Edwards and Gall confessed to what happened the night of Bernstein's death. Gall and Edwards had convinced Bernstein to take a short road trip on the pretext of stealing some drugs. They used one of Mary Ellen's cars for the trip. The hitmen admitted the job was messy and botched. They tried to strangle Bernstein in the car, but when he managed to escape, they pursued him. Paul Gall jumped out of the car, came around, helped pull Bernstein down onto the, to the pavement. Both of them got on top of him and started strangling him. Uh, at one time, they thought that he was actually dead. Uh, they got up both exhausted, and then Bernstein started to get up. Uh, they got on him again, and it finally killed him by strangling him. In the months that followed, Detective Daly retired, and the case was passed to Deputy District Attorney Janice Morisi and her investigator, Detective Terry Richardson. Morisi knew that it would be difficult to convince the jury that Mary Ellen could have masterminded the two murders. The more I studied the case prior to the trial, the more I realized that Mary Ellen Samuels was very good at convincing people to do anything that she wanted. I mean, anybody who can convince others to murder for her has got to be a pretty persuasive person. So I knew that that would be a problem in my experiences prior to trial with Mary Ellen Samuels in court. She always presented herself as, as the average housewife. And there certainly was nothing sinister about the way she looked or the way she acted. So I believed that it maybe was going to be a tough sell for the jury sitting there month after month staring at this woman to believe that she was capable of the things that we were accusing her of. Because of this concern, the prosecutors decided to offer Mary Ellen a plea bargain. But the defendant swiftly turned down the offer. But I think she believed that she could manipulate the jury just as she had so many others. And, um, I think she believed that she'd walk away free. Prosecutors had no hard evidence in the case. There was no murder weapon or trace evidence. Robert Samuel's assassin and the man who hired him were dead. And with only a handful of circumstantial witnesses and the testimony of two confessed killers, Janice Marisi would have to work hard show the jury how and why Mary Ellen had orchestrated these two murders. In March of 1994, Mary Ellen Samuels was brought to trial for the murders of her estranged husband, Robert Samuels, and suspected co-conspirator, James Bernstein. Mary Ellen Samuels was dubbed the Green Widow by the media when it was discovered that within a year of her husband's murder, 
she had spent more than a half a million dollars in insurance and inheritance money. Prosecutor Jan Marisi would start day one of the Samuels trial with a flourish that would send a buzz through a hushed courtroom and send tabloid reporters rushing for the phones. While on a trip to Cancun, a boyfriend of Mary Ellen's had taken a photograph of her lying naked on a bed, covered with $100 bills. Within days of the murder of her husband, Maurizi told the jury, Mary Ellen was out spending money, living the life of a queen. I had that photograph blown up, and I showed that to the jury, and I told them why I was showing it to them. I told the jury that uh, looking at her, she looks like the uh, perfect uh, demure housewife lady who wasn't capable of such horrible crimes. And yet, this is a picture, a uh, little bit of a picture, into the glimpse of the soul of the real person, Mary Ellen Samuels. Defense attorney Philip Namath, in his opening remarks, painted a different picture of the defendant. You've heard her and what she's had to say. She was a woman to be pitied, Ladies framed by friends who owed her money, and hounded by a scorned detective who kept photographs he had found of Make her wearing lingerie. Is as Namath focused his attack on the foundation of the prosecution's case. He argued that the prosecution's witnesses had no credibility. He reminded the jury that most of them received immunity in exchange for their testimony. The deal, he explained, had motivated the witnesses to implicate Mary Ellen in the murder of her husband. A husband who had abused her and her daughter for years. Maurizi's first order of business would be to refute the defense's allegations of abuse by Robert Samuels by bringing Detective George Daly to the stand. During the investigation, he had questioned Mary Ellen about her relationship to Robert. Yes, she said that she loved Robert Samuels and that they had a good relationship. Daly also testified about Mary Ellen's response to questions about abuse. I don't recall her specific statement, but I do recall her saying something to the effect that there was no abuse, no smacking around. Any further questions? One of Marisi's next witnesses was Michael Taylor, a former sandwich shop employee and one of Melissa's high school friends. His testimony helped to reveal that Mary Ellen's murder plans were widely known among Melissa's peers. Please stay and spell your name. Taylor testified to a conversation he had had with Mary Ellen's daughter, Melissa, prior to her stepfather's murder. <clears throat> she turned around and said, uh, well, you can't tell anybody this. So I said, okay, fine, whatever. And she said, my mom has somebody to kill my dad. Can you give me a gun? We need a weapon. Can you get me a gun? And, and I was just like, I couldn't believe that. I told her that, you know, I couldn't. In the defense's cross-examination, uh, Namath attempted to impeach Taylor's credibility questioning each event of that day. After 20 minutes of examination, it was clear that his testimony would hold up under scrutiny. Maurizi called Mary Ellen's friend Jane Stevens to the stand. According to Stevens' testimony, Mary Ellen told her she had convinced someone to help her kill her husband. She said she met him at Denny's and she was going to give him the money and he was going to be the hitman. Did she tell you how much money? She said $10,000. Maurizi then probed into the details of the transaction. Did she tell you anything about the payment? Something in regards to what looked like advertising for the restaurant. 
No further questions at this time. Defense attorney Namath cross-examined Stevens. And when she admitted that Mary Ellen had loaned her $2,500 to purchase a car, it bolstered the defense's claims that the debt helped motivate her to implicate her friend. During the course of the James Bernstein murder investigation, Ventura County Sheriff's interviewed Mark Johnson learned that he had been the anonymous caller who provided the first link between James Bernstein and Mike Silva, implicating them both in Robert Samuel's death. The prosecution put Johnson on the stand. Johnson testified that one night he and his girlfriend had been riding in Bernstein's car. When Bernstein's pager went off, Johnson read off the number and Bernstein used his car phone to arrange a meeting. We were going to be meeting someone. Arriving at a gas station, Bernstein instructed Johnson and his girlfriend to stay out of sight. Johnson testified that he watched Bernstein walk across the road to the other car and speak with the driver. When Bernstein returned, Johnson inquired about the man's identity. Bernstein told him that the man's name was Mike Silva and that he was the one who had killed Robert Samuels. The prosecution next called homicide detective John Beerer to the stand. On the night Mary Ellen discovered her husband's body, Beerer testified, her behavior was somewhat unusual. Did you tell the court and the jury about that incident? Beerer explained that he was surprised at Mary Ellen's demeanor at the crime scene. In his opinion, she should have been more emotional than she was. She did not seem at all upset. During that evening, did you have a... Morizzi next focused on a single incident that would help to illustrate Mary Ellen's apparent lack of grief. Beerer testified that while he was conducting a search of the house for evidence, just moments after the body of the victim had been removed, Mary Ellen had moved close to him. She touched my head and told me that she likes bald guys. Did you find this behavior unusual? Uh... Very unusual. I've never had that happen to me in my entire life, on or off duty. Never. Beerer was so able to provide a first hand yes. account of how Mary Ellen seemed unaffected by the death of her husband. Because he was an officer of the law, there was little doubt as to the credibility of his testimony. However, one of the prosecution's next witnesses would be the most vulnerable to attack. Many of the witnesses in the trial were testifying under grants of immunity, and that makes them somewhat suspect, as it should, to members of the jury. Um, unfortunately, when you prosecute cases like this, uh, you don't often have credible witnesses who are a part of such a long, ongoing conspiracy. Anne-Marie Hambly, like many of Mary Ellen's friends, would turn on her in exchange for immunity from prosecution. She would testify that although she helped Mary Ellen arrange James Bernstein's murder, she attempted to distance herself from the killing by demanding that Mary Ellen provide the car. What did you tell the defendant? I told her that Paul wanted to get, get the job done. Then he wanted to use my car. I, I did not want him to use my car. And, um... She wanted to get Jim killed. She had to have her car used. And did she agree to let you use her car? Yes. Yes. No further questions. 
Anne Hamley was actually given immunity for her testimony with regard to the James Bernstein murder because she clearly knew about the murder ahead of time, helped to facilitate it, um, helped to cover up afterwards. She, uh, she was present when the two hitmen left her house with James Bernstein um, to carry out their plan to kill him. She was present when they came back without him. In his cross-examination of Anne Hamley, defense attorney Philip Namath attempted to discredit the witness as a fair-weather friend who owed money to the defendant and turned on Mary Ellen in order to save herself. After calling approximately 45 witnesses over a period of more than three weeks, the prosecution rested and the defense began to present its case. Mary Ellen's daughter, Melissa, would waive her Fifth Amendment protection from self-incrimination and would take the witness stand in her mother's defense. Melissa, like her mother, would refute the testimony of former friends. Yesterday, I believe it was, Miss Marisi asked you why all of these people would lie either on you or your mother. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Uh, let me talk about a couple Namath things. asked Melissa if she knew of a reason why reasons. Michael Taylor would have lied. Yes, I do. What is that? He stole money from the subway. Melissa denied asking her school friends for a gun. She also denied telling classmates that she had attempted to make her father's assassination look like a burglary gone bad. Then the defense launched the attack the prosecution had been expecting. Mary Ellen's daughter told the court that she had suffered physical and sexual abuse at the hands of her stepfather, Robert Samuels. Did there become a time when your father's abuse became something different than physical? Yes, there did. And can you tell me the first incident that happened and how old you were? I was 13. Melissa testified that her stepfather, Robert, had raped her eight times between the ages of 13 and 18. According to Melissa, Robert Samuels was a drunken monster in his own home, inflicting mental, physical, and sexual abuse on her and her mother. The defense in the case seemed to be what we refer to in the profession as, as an abuse excuse. However, this was kind of a hybrid of that because it was, I was abused, but I didn't do it anyway. So it was a little bit unusual to have this defense presented that would suggest really that Bob Samuels and James Bernstein, for that matter, deserved to be murdered, and yet at the same time uh, be saying that I didn't, in fact, murder them. I had nothing to do with it. The climax of the trial came when the widow herself took the stand in her own defense. The defense calls Mary Ellen Samuels to the stand. Prosecutor Morisi knew she was about to face a cunning and experienced adversary. The widow's ability to manipulate people could persuade some of the jurors to sympathize with her and lead to her acquittal. A stunned courtroom had just heard the testimony of Melissa Samuels, whose allegations of physical and sexual abuse by her stepfather supported the defense's claim that Mary Ellen Samuels was the real victim in this case. On the stand, Mary Ellen Samuels described a horrific six-year marriage in which she was beaten and raped by her husband. She left Robert to protect her daughter, Melissa. When he grabbed you and hit you that evening, did you have any bruises or marks the following day? Yes, I did. Can you describe the marks or bruises? My arms were sore. I could hardly move them, and they were bruised. I didn't realize that I had black eye. It's the first black eye I've ever had in my life. <clears throat> No further questions.
Prosecutor Jan Marisi would turn Mary Ellen's own words against her with a letter she had written to her husband when she left him. Where in this entire letter do you confront him with his abuse against you? I didn't. Marisi began to attack Mary Ellen, claiming that the reason she had not written about her allegations of Robert's abuse was because she had invented them. I didn't. That's not true. I didn't want to air on any dirty laundry on paper. One instance, she testified about a black eye that she had had, and she actually brought in a neighbor to corroborate that she had had a black eye. She blamed Robert Samuels for that black eye, but in truth and in fact, we were able to find out that she had just had plastic surgery, and that was the reason for the black eye. Morisi stayed on the offensive, questioning Mary Ellen about every time she told investigators that Robert had never been abusive to her or her daughter. Why, she asked, if the alleged abuse was occurring, did she fail to reveal that fact to the police? The charges contained special circumstances of murder for financial gain. If only one juror believed that Mary Ellen conspired to murder Robert because he was abusive, that would create a reasonable doubt which would deny a conviction for the prosecution. In the defense's closing argument, Namath submitted to the jury that the defense had proven that there had been both physical and sexual abuse. He also asserted that the prosecution's case should be based on physical proof, cold, hard facts, and the prosecution had none. In her closing, Morisi told the jury that Mary Ellen had fabricated the stories of abuse in order to gain their sympathy. She explained that the prosecution had submitted enough evidence to show that Mary Ellen had conspired to commit two murders and that she should be held accountable for them. This case does come down to credibility. And it is a matter of you deciding who you believe. The jury would take those words into deliberations and consider them for the next 18 days. The wait was nerve wracking, but the prosecutors knew that there were many complex charges to consider and that would take time. Finally, the jury returned declaring Mary Ellen Samuels guilty on two counts each of murder in the first degree, conspiracy, and solicitation. Two days later, the jurors delivered their sentence, death. I believe that Mary Ellen Samuels is where she belongs on death row. I believe that the community is a safer place because she is there on death row. Uh, but it's not something that I take any particular joy over because there are no winners when you prosecute these cases. There's just, there's just losers. There is loss um, and devastation that can, can never be overcome, particularly for the families and, and the murder victims. She can say goodbye to her family and her loved ones, and Bob Samuels and James Bernstein never got that opportunity. There is a small but growing number of women on death row. Since California reinstated the death penalty in 1977, only a handful of women have been sent to Chochilla Prison, where female death row inmates are kept. Now, Mary Ellen Samuels would be joining them. Although there seemed to be some minor property damage inside the house, detectives observed there were no signs of forced entry and no signs of burglary. Mary Ellen Samuel's best friend, Anne Marie Hambly, arrived at Robert's home to console her grieving friend. She too was interviewed, but could give investigators no information about the crime. 
Detective George Daly was assigned to head the murder investigation. One of his first tasks would be to eliminate the family members as suspects. In most uh, cases of murder, uh, I would say 85% uh, or more uh, of the time, the murderer or conspirators are uh, someone who the victim knows. Mary Ellen's daughter, Melissa, was given a gunshot residue test. This procedure detects any gunpowder residue on an individual who has recently discharged a firearm. Mary Ellen Samuels also agreed to be tested. The results for both mother and daughter were negative. Neither had recently fired a weapon. That night, Mary Ellen agreed to visit the police station. Investigators wanted to know if Robert might have known his attacker, or if Mary Ellen knew of anyone who might have a reason to kill him. She told investigators that she and her husband had been separated for two years and were on friendly terms. She mentioned several people who might have held grudges against her husband, but her theories provided no substantial leads. An autopsy revealed that Samuel suffered blunt force trauma to his head prior to being shot. It was an immediate disabling injury. The gunshot that killed Samuels was fired mere inches from his head, approximately 12 to 24 hours before the body's discovery. Where was the entry point? He shot right through the head, through the pillow. Fragments extracted from the victim revealed that a 16 gauge shotgun had been used in the attack. The blast had been fired through a pillow placed over the victim's head after he had been struck to the floor. The killing appeared to be the cold-blooded act of an assassin. News of Samuel's death spread quickly. Robert Samuels was a well-respected camera technician and had worked on such films as Heaven Can Wait, Lethal Weapon 2, and The Color Purple. Detective Daly had little to go on. There were no fingerprints, no fiber or hair evidence at the scene, and no eyewitnesses. He next turned to the victim's family and paid a... People, um, you just, you have a sense of, of a need to make sure that justice is done. In this episode, some of the names of family members and witnesses have been changed to protect their identities. A few weeks before Christmas 1988, in the secluded neighborhood of Sepulveda, a few miles north of Hollywood, Los Angeles police investigate a homicide. A man named Robert Samuels was found shot to death in his home. The victim's wife, Mary Ellen Samuels, told investigators that she and her daughter, Melissa, had stopped by her husband's house to drop off their dog. They discovered Robert lying dead on the floor. It appeared that the victim had been about to walk into a room containing a tanning bed when he was attacked. When prime suspects, one by one, start turning up dead, the prosecutors begin to fear that a mastermind killer will never be brought to justice. On 
December 9, 1988, a Hollywood cameraman was found murdered in his Southern California home. It would take investigators more than five years to bring a suspect to trial. Prosecutor Janice Morisi would attempt to find justice in the aftermath of this brutal crime. When you prosecute cases and you see the crime scene photos and you see the horror of what has actually happened and you see the devastation and you meet the family members and you see these things happening in the community that you live in and the, the victims and the victims' families are real people.